Family Theater presents Marshall Thompson and Gig Young. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Coincidence, starring Marshall Thompson. And now, here is your host, Gig Young. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives. If we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Yeah. Now to our transcribed drama, Coincidence, starring Marshall Thompson as Tom. I had met Harry Moyles twice, the day I reported for work at the studio, and one other time, three weeks later, when he was passing through the commissary on the way to the executive's dining room. As a rule, that's par for the course, since most executive producers speak only to other producers. But Harry had been a screenwriter himself years ago, so I was more flattered than surprised when his secretary called me last Thursday and said that Mr. Moyles would like to see me in his office. Come in, Tom. Sit down. Oh, thank you. Cigarette? Oh, I just put one out, thanks. Well, you've been here almost two months. How do you like Hollywood? Oh, very well indeed. <laughs> Especially the money. Yes, the money's good. Uncle Sam gets most of it, but it's still good. Well, at least he gets to spend it. Yes, he does it there. Well, the reason I called you in is to tell you I like this. Oh, I, uh, I was hoping you would. We've had the screen rights to these properties of Morrison's for years. Novels, short stories, sketches. Dozens of people have tried to adapt them for pictures, but the stuff just didn't seem to gel. And even this one? Twilight? Oh, yes. A great novel, but we couldn't string it together to make anything for the screen. I tried it myself 20 years ago. Hashed the thing up something awful. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm doubly flattered, Mr. Moyles. Harry. Uh, okay. Not around here, of course, but like tonight, when you're a guest in my house. We're friends. We're informal. Uh, tonight? <laughs> I did it backwards. You and Mrs. Elliot are invited for dinner tonight at my place. It's in Bel Air. June at the desk will give you the address and the directions. Well, that's, that's very generous you of you. You can make it, can't you? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Oh, don't say I invited you this late. Irene will take my head off. <laughs> Not a word. She's the one, my wife, Irene, who got interested in your work and thought you might be able to lick this Morrison stuff we have. You're an admirer of his, aren't you? Well, that's, that's putting it mild. I... I think he was the best writer America's produced in the last 30 years. Yes, he was good, all right. You, uh, you knew him, didn't you, Mr. Moyles? Well, for a few months, back in the 20s when he came out here to get on his feet again. What was he like to work with? <laughs> How did you know I'd worked with him? I was down in the story department a few weeks ago looking through a catalog of unproduced properties and saw both your names on a couple of originals. Yes, yes, we tried a few together. And to answer you, Phil Morrison was a difficult man to get anything accomplished with. He didn't like pictures. I, I noticed that none of the material you worked on together was based on any of his novels or short stories. Well, you see, we didn't acquire any of the rights to those until after he'd left the studio. Oh, was that before he died? Yes, yes, it was. Um... Yes? Oh, I, I was just going to ask uh, what time we're expected this evening. Oh, around seven. We're just having in a few friends, black tie. Oh, good enough. Irene's looking forward very anxiously to meeting you and your wife. Well, don't worry. We'll be there. Tom, it's almost ten of seven. You make it. Don't panic. I think we're lost. This is mountain country. This is Sepulveda Boulevard, and it's the shortest route from the valley to Bel Air. Now, calm down. What should I not talk to Mr. Moyles about? Hmm? Well, is he any special hates, peeves, phobias? Mm, not that I know of. Just stay on pictures, his pictures. You, you can't go wrong. How about his wife? 
Irene Stewart? Mm, big silent screen star. Retired about, oh, 25 years ago. Just about the time I was born. Betty, whatever you do, please don't say that. <laughs> I was just kidding. Okay. Well, what's the matter tonight? I should think you'd be all revved up about having dinner with the boss. I am revved up. You're in a big brown study. I am not. You am, too. But if you don't want to talk about it... But I don't know. There's something funny about this job. Funny about that studio. Well, I thought you liked working there. Well, I do like it. But the way I got the job in the first place is still puzzling me. You're a fine writer. This town's crawling with fine writers. Not as good as you. Thank you, baby, but better than me. No. At least when it comes to pictures. I've been writing for magazines for the last eight years. You sold two stories to Hollywood. Which they never produced. And you wrote a wow of a biographical series on Philip Morrison for The Post. Mm. Tom, what did you mean, there's something funny about the studio? Harry Moyles. What about him? Well, I ran across something in their story files I, I can't figure out. Years ago, better than 30 years ago, Morrison came out here to work for the studio. He was on the skids, needed money. He and Moyles turned out a few screen stories together. Well, that's a coincidence. Yeah, well, I've got a bigger one for you. Morrison quit the studio right in the middle of a story that he and Moyles were working on. It's unfinished. I found a synopsis of it in the files. Stuff's all dated. Morrison quit in March, and less than three months later, the studio bought up the screen rights to every story, novel, sketch, everything he's ever written. Paid him about $100,000. Mm, nice. Yeah, in those days, it was even nicer. Morrison stayed out here and started to work on a new novel. That couldn't have been very long before he was killed, was it? About six months. His car went over a cliff out near Malibu, and he was burned to death. Isn't that what happened? Exactly. Well, what's the coincidence? Well, one of the characters in the unfinished story that he and Moyles were working on at the studio almost a year before was a novelist who was burned to death when his car went over a cliff. The party at Harry Moyles was big and expensive and, for the most part, uneventful. Except for one thing that happened just a few minutes before Betty and I left. It was about 11.30 and some of the guests were getting their coats. We were standing in the vestibule admiring what I think was an original Goya when somebody tapped me on the arm. Tom. Oh, yes, Mrs. Moyles. Betty, I want to steal your husband away. Can I do it? <laughs> well, that remains to be seen. It will only be a minute. Oh, no rush. I've got Goya to keep me company. Right here in the library, Tom. It's something I think you'll be very much interested in. Well, I must say you call it by the right name. This is a library. A few years back, Harry started collecting first editions, but then he lost interest. Oh, it's beautiful. Here's what I wanted to show you. The books on this shelf. Hmm, well, Phil Morrison's books. All of them. They were a present from him. Every one is autographed. Well, you know, some of these have been out of print for years, Mrs. Moyles. If there's any that you'd like to borrow... Oh, well, thanks just the same, but I'm a bad returner once I get hold of a book. Oh, that wouldn't matter. You made such a close study of his work. If anyone should have a right to read these... Irene, our guests are leaving. Oh, excuse me, Tom. Oh, I was just going, Harry. Uh, your wife's been showing me your collection. Yes, I, I should have kept it up. You probably got the only complete set of Morrison in the country. Yes, I guess we have. Well, uh, thank you again for your hospitality, Mrs. Moyles. Oh, we were delighted to have you, Tom. Oh, I must go out and say good night to your wife. Oh, Irene, there's something I want to ask you. We'll be right along, Tom. Yes, you bet. Tom, I think you'd better get my rat. Well, everybody's leaving. Will you be quiet a minute? What's the matter with you showing him those books? I just wanted him to see them. What harm can that do? Are you out of your mind? He's an expert on Morrison. Suppose he starts digging around. What if he does? Do you want this thing to blow up in your face? I don't care anymore. I'm tired of being punished. Well, I do care. I'm not the one who's done the punishing. Oh, Harry, please. No, no. We do this my way or we don't do it at all. Now, fix up your face. You've got to say goodnight to the guests. Come on, honey, let's get out of here. Tom, what's it all about? I don't know. I don't know yet, but I'll find out. Now, come on, come on. The next day at the studio, I put in my eight hours, expecting any minute that the phone would ring and Mr. Moyles would want to see me. But it didn't. 
And that night after dinner, Betty and I started through the copies of Morrison's books that I'd brought with me from New York, looking for, well, we didn't know what. Tom. Hmm? Will you answer me something truthfully? Well, try to. Why are you doing this? Digging into Morrison's past and Irene's and Mr. Moyle's? Well, at the risk of sounding cynical, it could make a fascinating and uh, lucrative sequel to the magazine series I did on Morrison last year. And maybe one just a mite sensational? <laughs> Look, honey, he was a national figure, a celebrity. In the last two years of his life, which he spent out here are sure filled with question marks. Like the coincidence of driving over a cliff when he'd previously worked on a story with the same gimmick in it? With Harry Moyle. Well, what of it? Whose wife obviously had some connection with Morris. He gave her a set of his books. Yeah, to Irene, with deepest affection. For authors, that's not an uncommon dedication. Well, what about the argument she and Harry had in the library last night? Well, maybe he's jealous. Of a man who's been dead for 30 years? It's conceivable. It wasn't that kind of an argument. Well, they've got a secret between them, and, and Moyle's as scared of death it's going to get out. Well... You poke around into the past all you want, but I think one coincidence is mighty slim evidence to go on. All right. But why did they buy up the screen rights to all of Morrison's properties less than two months after he left the studio? Maybe they wanted... Well, he was a has-been. His books weren't selling. He was on the skids. Why did they buy them then, especially at that kind of a price? It just doesn't add up. I still think they may have wanted them. Not one picture has been made of his stuff. Not one. You told me Moyle said the books were hard to adapt. Oh, baloney. Honey, take it easy. You, look, you lift out the symbolism and the introspection, and you've got good, solid drama. Tom, you don't have to yell. I just don't get it. He was a great writer. Honey, honey. For years, they slept off his work like it was nothing. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Betty. I, there's something else going on here. I... I want to get the answer to it. Tom. I'm sorry I, I yelled at you. Don't be. I think you're doing what's right. Oh, I hope so. Whether it ever gets published or not. Early the following week... Harry Moyles left on a short business trip to the east, and his wife, Irene, accompanied him. I waited until the next afternoon and then drove out to Harry's place in Bel Air. The houseboy let me in and turned me over to a Mr. Weldon, a, a fussy little man I had met briefly at the dinner party the previous week. Turned out he worked for Mrs. Moyles as a combination household manager and social secretary. Yes, indeed, Mr. Elliot. I remember you quite well. Well, thanks. Uh, not many people do. Mrs. Moyles will be terribly sorry she's missed you. Well, it, it wasn't really a social call. Uh, but, but she offered to let me borrow one of her Morrison books if I wanted to. And oh, my, my. I... Was anything wrong? Well, I do wish that she'd left me a memo about that. Not that she'd mind. I'm sure she wouldn't. It's Mr. Moyles. It goes back to his first edition period. Uh, I beg your pardon? Well, about five years ago, he started collecting first editions, and he laid down an inflexible rule. No books borrowed from the library. Well, I, I can certainly understand that. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I, I don't want to take any of the books with me. Oh, well, in that case, I'm sure there won't be trouble. A couple of them are supposed to be out of print. I, uh, I just like to get the name of the publisher and the publication date and, and see if I could run down a copy somewhere. Oh, well, by all means, come along. I'm quite sure Mr. Moyles will have no objection to that. I think you'll find the Morrison shelf over there. Yes, uh, Mrs. Moyles showed it to me the other night. They should be arranged in order of their publications. Uh, I'm, I'm especially interested in the last novel he wrote uh, just before he died. Oh, yes, yes, that would be this one. A Fool There Was. Thank you. Well, uh, let's see, uh, title page, publication... Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weldon. Uh, this is just what I was looking for. I still don't think this is enough to make a case of. His last novel, right there in cold type, dedicated to I Am With Love, Irene Moyles. Hanky-panky? Yeah, sure looks like it. And where does Harry Moyles come into this? I don't know. But you're thinking plenty. I'm thinking I get pretty mad at a guy who went around dedicating novels to my wife. Mad enough to push him over a cliff? Well, maybe. Although I must admit, Harry doesn't seem like the type. Well, I wouldn't know about that. But I think he'd be a little more inventive. How do you mean? Well, if he was going to murder a man, 
Why would he use a method that he'd already signed his name to in a story? Well, maybe he'd forgotten he ever wrote such a thing. Oh, Look, what? guys like Harry were the workhorses out here 30 years ago. They came up with a scenario every week. What's original about a car going over a cliff? Well, then why do you attach so much importance to because it? Because that's the way Morrison died. And you think Harry Moyles killed him? I don't know. But if he did, and he did it in a hurry, this is the way he might have chosen. Tom, if you really think there's something to this, why don't you go to the police? Well, I thought about it, and I did the next best thing. What? I hired a private detective, mostly to poke around in official files and whatnot. Does he know what you're trying to prove? No, no, no. I, uh, I told him it was just a research job on Morrison. I, I showed him the, the magazine series I did last year, and I think he swallowed it. Well, maybe he'll turn up something you can use. Yeah, yeah. I just wish I could be sure I wanted him to. The following Monday was the big day. And like most big days, it started pretty small. I went to the studio and worked from nine until noon. While I was having lunch, I heard that Harry Moyles was back in town. He'd flown in from New York late Sunday afternoon, but he hadn't come into work yet. It was about 1.30 when I got the call from private investigator George Gilbert. He wanted to see me that afternoon in his office, a cramped two-room affair in downtown Hollywood. Well, Mr. Elliott, I've got a few things here for you. Some telegraph from the east, some on long distance. I'll have written confirmation for most of it in a day or so. Uh, how about uh, what you got at this end? Well, not too much. Most of it confirms what you told me. Morrison died in the automobile crash out at Malibu, August 1926. It wasn't his car, though. Oh, did you find out whose it was? Yes, it was a rented car. I guess they called them chartered cars then. A 1924 Apperson. Uh, I ran across one funny thing, though. Yes? Morrison didn't have a driver's permit, and for what I can make out, he never even owned a car, either out here or back east. Well, would you conclude from that that he didn't drive at all, maybe didn't even know how to? Well, he was driving the car that went over the cliff, which ain't saying he knew how very well. Hmm. well what else? I got nowhere on his literary estate. It's handled by a New York lawyer named, uh, let's see here, Folsom. Apparently Morrison had relatives somewhere in the east, but I couldn't find out where or what their names were. Well, does the estate amount to anything? Well, someone's been taking money out of it for years, but I don't know who or just how much. Well, if you don't know that, how do you know it's been happening at all? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Elliott, that is a confidential source. Oh, you mean I'll just have to take your word for it? Huh? <laughs> well, let's face it, you're not taking it for much. <laughs> well, I, I guess that's it. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes, just a moment, please. It's for you, Mr. Elliott. Are you sure? Yes, it's a lady. It says she's your wife. Oh. Hello? Yes, Betty. You what? Harry called and told you this? Okay, yeah, sure, sure. And he wants you to come along too, huh? All right. Look, you call a cab. I'll meet you out there. Uh, do you know the address of their place? No, that's right, Bel Air. And I'll leave right now. The evening rush had started along sunset, so it was almost an hour before I pulled into the curved driveway in front of Harry Moyle's place. The houseboy told me that Betty had already arrived and that she, Harry, and Mrs. Moyles are waiting for me in the library. Good evening, Elliot. Harry, Mrs. Moyles. Oh, Tom, what took you so long, honey? Uh, traffic was pretty heavy. Yes, it can get rough at this hour. Well, can I offer you something? Oh, no, no, thanks. Well, then have a seat. I don't suppose there's much to be gained in beating around the bush. You've probably guessed what I brought you out here to discuss. Something about Morrison? Quite a lot about Morrison. Well, if it concerns my looking through your books here while you're out of town... Tom, I'll... give me credit for having a little sense. I know what you're trying to find out, but I want to make sure you know exactly what you're doing before you decide to go ahead. Harry, you gave me your word. And I intend to keep it. But this has been coming for 30 years. You can't I... be sure. You're assuming too much. I warned you it would happen, but you wouldn't listen. Well, now it's happening, and I have to think of myself. Harry, uh, this is not only embarrassing, but I frankly don't know what it's all about. You haven't had a private detective making inquiries into Morrison's background for the last week? All right, now let's put our cards on the table. You think I'm somehow implicated in Morrison's death, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid I do. You see? That doesn't mean he knows anything. It means he's looking. Harry, I... I guess I've been brought out here to be threatened, but threatened. I... Oh, no, Tom, you mustn't think that. Let me tell him what he must think. Well, I don't threaten people, my boy. 
but I make certain that a man who works for me has no secrets. In your case, I've made doubly certain. And what have you found? You've been doing some amateur detective work in my legal department, my story files, the library of my own home. All right. Tell me exactly what conclusions you've reached. They aren't very pretty. Forget that. Just tell me. I think you were jealous of Morrison's attentions to your wife, and you killed him. Tom! Let him finish. And then I ran him over the cliff in much the same manner as in that unfinished story that he and I were working on at the studio. Hmm? Well, Morrison didn't have a driver's permit. There seems to be some doubt as to whether he could drive at all. So most of your evidence is just guesswork. Yes, it wouldn't hold up in court. But it might make good reading, especially in view of the printed dedication in Morrison's last book to I.M. Well, you can't very well stop people from speculating that the initials stand for Irene Moyles. No, you can't. Mrs. Elliot. Yes? Your husband is a persistent seeker after the truth, isn't he? I'd say so. I wonder just how persistent. Why don't you try me and find out? I intend to. Oh, Harry, please, in heaven's name. No, Irene, no. I, I don't feel sorry for you anymore. Tonight I'm feeling sorry for myself. I don't like the feeling, so I'm going to get rid of it. Tom. Yes? You say you think I pushed Morrison over the cliff in that car? Yes. You're right. I did. Harry, if you're determined to make a confession... He was dead when I pushed him over. He had died an hour earlier of a heart attack. A heart attack? Brought on by a violent argument with the woman to whom he was secretly married. Morrison was never married. You can find a copy of the marriage certificate in the files of the City Hall at Monterey, dated December 9th, 1925. The woman used her real name, Doris Youngblood. Well, there's never been the slightest evidence that Morrison was married. That was because of the woman. She had a film contract which prohibited marriage. Harry! A film contract? You've told him enough! The woman's professional name was Irene Stewart. You were Morrison's wife? Harry, you've told him enough! He will tell me when I've told him enough. So... So the dedication on his last novel to I.M. was to... To Irene Morrison, not Moyles. We weren't married until over a year after his death, November 1927. That can be proven very easily. Well, I, uh... I guess all I can do is, is apologize, Harry. Your apology is accepted. I suppose I'm... I'm fired. No, no, not unless you want to be. No, I, I don't want to be. I, I like what I'm doing. And you have no further questions? What few I might have don't seem to be of any, any of my business. But you have them. Well, let's say that whatever they are, they've been pushed into the back of my mind. But the matter not being your business hasn't stopped you from coming this far. He's trying to say he's heard enough, Harry. Let him alone. I don't believe that. Look, look I'm, I'm ashamed enough about this as it is. So you want to walk out of here with your wife, drive back to the valley, and forget it? Yes. And what will you talk about on the way home? Harry! Be honest with yourself, Irene. This will never be finished until Tom Elliott wants it finished. Believe me, Harry, I... You and Betty will talk about this discussion we've had. And you or she will say, I wonder why Harry Moyles took it on himself to conceal the place and manner in which Morrison died. Or, I wonder what the violent argument was about which led to his death. Am I wrong? I don't think any private discussion I might have with my wife will affect you or Mrs. Moyles. You don't understand yourself very well, Tom. Oh, I've seen you come and go for years, the seeker after truth, the born researcher. You won't stop here. Harry, will you let him alone? Yes, when I'm convinced he's willing to let us alone. And he isn't. He isn't. It's written all over his face. I guess you're right. I do want the answers to those questions. I was one of the few people at the studio who knew that Irene and Morrison were secretly married. I'd been in love with her long before she met him. Oh, Harry, for heaven's sake! We've been married for almost 30 years. Is it a secret that I'm in love with you? Oh, no, dear, but... It was I who arranged the purchase of Morrison's literary properties by the studio. It made him financially independent, gave him a chance to go back to work on his novel. I see. His last novel, A Fool There Was. Up to that point, he was willing to go along with Irene and keep the marriage a secret. She had a career to think about. Morrison could sympathize with that. But then they learned that she was going to have a child, and Morrison insisted the marriage be made public. And that was what the argument was about? That was it. And after his heart attack, you disposed of Morrison's body to protect Irene? Yes. She went east and had the child. By then, of course, the studio knew everything, but she was a big star. They took pains to protect her. Well, I, I guess that clears up just about everything. The child was a boy, born in Philadelphia, January 1927. You don't have to say anymore. Irene adopted him out. There was no other way. There's no need to tell me this. The administration of his father's literary estate was left in the hands of a lawyer named Falsam. It was Falsam who contacted us in the East last week and said someone was making inquiries. Harry, I don't need to know anything else. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Very well. 
Come on, honey. Tom. Let's get out of here. Betty and I left the library and in the house of Harry Moyles and his wife, Irene. And we will not go back. And all the way home, I held in my mind the picture of the heavy set druggist and his wife, whom I'd, had, I'd called mother and father, and the life we had known. But they were dead now, and there were no more questions I could ask them. There were no more questions I wanted to ask. I had probed into the past of a man I admired, a man, a man with whom I had felt a close kinship. But now I would forget him, because he was as dead as my parents. So was the past he was part of. And in time, I might even forget that somewhere a son of his still lived who, like me, was born in January 1927 in Philadelphia. This is Gig Young again. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin who said... A man cannot do a single good deed because every good deed we do is passed on from one person to another and continues to multiply itself among many people. All of us can look back in our lives and remember someone who helped us in difficulties and it meant a renewal of our faith and hope and a promise that when we'd have an opportunity, we would be generous and unselfish in helping others. Yes, we have the opportunity to help those in need. And among the greatest needs in the world today, is a renewal of charity and brotherhood and faith in God, a renewal of the practice of family prayer. With God, all things are possible. With God's help, our lives, our homes, our families, and the world can be kept in peace and happiness. But we must ask for that help. We must pray sincerely, humbly, not only by ourselves, but as a family. A prayerful home is a happy home, and a prayerful world is a peaceful world, because nations that pray together for peace will live together in peace, just as the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Coincidence, starring Marshall Thompson. Gig Young was your host. Others in our cast were Edgar Berrier, Charlotte Lawrence, Margaret Brayton, Michael Hayes, and Herbert Ellis. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Flight to Bermuda, starring Dorothy Warrenshold as Joe. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. Mm -hmm.